Hi, I'm Chris Giamo. And at TD Bank, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important financial issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by TD Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. The law firm of Gibbons PC, the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Insurance fraud costs New Jersey families $1,300 a year. And by NJM Insurance Group. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ. And by JerseyBites.com. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got, you got this? There it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center in Manhattan. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce for the first time with us uh, Catherine Nori Hughes, otherwise known as Kate, if you will, the author of a fascinating book called The Map Maker's Daughter. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. This, this book took you, we were just talking about before we got in the air, 20 years. Yeah, it didn't take 20 years to write, thank God. Process. But it, it, from the beginning of the, uh, the project, when the idea was first brought to me by a professor of mine at Princeton, till its publication in this past August, it's 20 years. Mm. The hook, no, the hook, I shouldn't say that. The primary theme of the book. It's a story about the bond between a 12-year-old girl and the most powerful man on earth, who at the time was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Mm. It's a story about who that girl becomes, um, very much under his influence. And it's about the trust that they repose in each other and why, why they feel this trust. And um, it's about the sense she tries to, and succeeds in making of her life as the book unfolds. It is an end, it's a sick bed. I won't say deathbed because I don't want to give too sure. much away. Um, <clears throat> memoir. So it's toward the very end of her life. And she wants to get to the bottom of who she is and why she's done the things she's done. What drew you to her as a character? What draws you to her as a character? She, she was enormously power. That's powerful. That's what I was told in the beginning by my professor at Princeton. Who's Excuse me, her name is Nir Nirbanu. Nir Nirbanu. That's right, the I'm name sorry. that Suleiman gave her. She was born, Ch oh, you like this, she was Italian. She was Venetian. <laughs> Cecilia Baffo Veniero. Yes. And, um, our family is from Naples. We found our way up there at some point. <laughs> Go ahead. So you know how important, important the, this is set in the middle of the 16th century, yes. right? When the Ottoman Empire is at the yes. apex of its power. Um, and what my professor at Princeton, Bernard Lewis, said was that there was this woman who was gigantically powerful when the e empire was at the height of its power, but very little was known about her. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered, well, why that, you know, I wondered about that incongruity, the amount of power and the little that was known. And that clearly made her very attractive as a subject for fiction, which this most definitely is. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a writer of fiction. I'm not an historian, so... You know, but over the 20 years, the process, to what degree, Kate, did, the, did she change for you as a writer? It's a great question. Uh, in, enormously. She changed because I got to know her better, but she also changed because I changed. Mm. If this book had, if I'd been able to somehow to do this book in three years, she, she would have been a different character. When I started Okay, she dies when she's 58 years old. Right. When I started the book, <laughs> I was 48. And I thought, um, okay, my goal is to finish this book before I'm the age she was when <laughs> she died. And so I blew through 58, and, um, and I changed a lot. Um, How so? 
I, well, importantly, I became a grandmother in that time. Um, when I started, I, I wasn't a grandmother. Now my grandson drives a car, to give you an <laughs> idea. Um, I wasn't on Medicaid when I started this thing. Um, I have become more patient. I learned, part of the reason why it took so long was because every publisher that looked at it didn't accept it. So You I, had some rejections. I had some rejections. And, I, and I'm not given to taking no for an answer, but I learned, <laughs> I learned how to, and I, and I learned from the no. Um, Aside from Jordan, explain that to people who often hear no. I hear no, I've heard no, I'm sure I'll hear it again. Right. Dealing with rejection. Part of why I was able to stick with this and deal with the rejections is because, and this again is just my character, I put all my eggs in one basket with this project. All in. I, yeah, I really did. And with the thing, goodness, I had an enormously supportive husband who made it possible for me to do that. I left a paying job that I had, and I just decided I was going to give this absolutely everything I had. Yeah. And so the rejections, they didn't hurt less as a result, but they were... They were more motivating than they were dispiriting. Um, and they did make me a better writer. There's absolutely no question about it. I want to plug this before I come back to something. The book is called The Mapmaker's Daughter. Um, Katie took just a few years to, uh, Kate just took a few years to write this. I would be remiss if I did not bring up another piece to your story. Robert Del Tufo, former attorney general um, in New Jersey huge influence on my life, and I told you this before you got on the air, on the lives of so many of us who grew up in New Jersey, um, who went into public life at an early age. He was the role model for integrity, honesty, character, and simply doing the right thing. That's right. He was. He was my husband. Um, mm -hmm. We were... We were married... We got married a couple of years before I began the book, and as I said, I, I, I really wouldn't have had the nerve to you know, leave a good paying job and, and go unbidden in, into this land of writing fiction. Sure. I'd never written a novel before. And his, his attitude was, you can't even think about not doing this. Um, he was all in for you. Absolutely, he was. Um, he's all in for anything that he took seriously. Um, and you know that, and I know your father knew it, and... Um, People who've been new, around New Jersey for a long time know it. He, he really did stand for integrity. He, stood up he against did. a lot of odds and. I mean, he was you know he was there <clears throat> during Abscam, as he you know. He was more than there. He he was more than there. He was the United States Attorney at the time under Carter, and um, you know he. He took, led that investigation. Yes, he did, and uh, it was you know it was very complicated, and he he went right up against it. <sighs> um. I also would be remiss if I didn't ask you this. There are so many people watching us, particularly in public broadcasting. They see themselves as writers. They want to be writers. Advice to them? Oh, yes. If you want to be a writer, don't let anything stop you. Um, pay close attention to everything that's around you. And absolutely don't give up. And be as honest with yourself as you can. I mean, that's really... This 20-year trajectory of the book... Um, it follows the trajectory of this character's life. I just want, I want to say this about its structure. It's told in a 30-day period of, mm. of a journal. And as she, so in the 30 days, she's recalling the 58 years of her life. But it's in the course of those days that she gets increasingly honest. So she'll, say, she'll, she'll make an observation about a relationship, say, on mm. day four of the journal. And on day six, she realizes that that wasn't absolutely honest, and she revises it. Wow. And so by the end, she gets to the truth of who she is and why she's done what she did. And I followed a sort of similar trajectory, I think. Hey, thank you for doing this. Thank it's you for being with us. Pleasure. Thank you for inspiring others. And um, look up Robert Del Tufo. Yes. Research it. Thank you for the way you researched the way you did for this book, The Map Maker's Daughter. Um, thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. Stay right there. You're welcome anytime in public broadcasting. Be right back right after this. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are pleased to welcome uh, Martina Mayok, 
who is a playwright, and she has a new play called Queens. It's playing at the... LCT3 Theater at Lincoln Center, the Claritao Theater. We are right here in yeah, Lincoln yeah. Center. <laughs> who are you, and, and do you, in fact, come from Poland? I do. Originally. Yeah. You settled in beautiful Kearney, New Jersey, right. which I know well because I'm from the next That's town right. over in Newark. We're friends. Yeah. Harrison is in between. Yeah, yeah. It depends yeah. on where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Is it true there was a bar at every corner in Harrison? You don't I know guess. these things, okay? Yeah. I mean, listen. I was like, I mean, I mean, no, right? Because I never went to bars. Where you I did was not. Where, no, okay. of course. Describe the neighborhood yeah. you grew up in in Kearney. Uh, it's K-E-A-R-N-Y. Why? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No E's, no there. So, so a big like immigrant neighborhood, working class. Um, everybody was from somewhere else. Like I like a thing that I would the notice is that while kids were learning to to walk, their parents were learning to speak English. Like That's a lot right. of the things. So, um, yeah, like a big a melting pot. Yeah. Yeah, everyone's from somewhere else, which is really, I think there's a lot of places that, like, will, uh, there'll be one specific immigrant nationality in a place, whereas, right. like, this this was, everybody was from, 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 every, from everywhere. Because so. my neighborhood in Newark was yeah. virtually all Italian. There was always yeah. one Irish kid. <laughs> um, but it was, but you had a real true melting pot. Yeah. Um, describe the play. Uh, Queens is a three-act, three-hour play. I swear it's funny. Like all my plays are like these like seemingly depressing, sad stories. It's like it's like my friend calls them "hear me out" plays. It's like I have to like tell what it's about, but then they say "hear me out." It's funny. That's right. Like it's entertaining. All this but this stuff. is so funny. It's, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny. Okay. It's funny. You Got know, it. uh, well, you, you need humor. You need humor for like the for for political theater. Where does your humor was, come from? Uh, deep sadness and. <laughs> Stop. No, like you, like just I guess like a hard upbringing. I think it's like you, you. My perspective about what's funny, like um, it, it, it has to cost you something. Like somebody, some, somebody's um, uh, uh, what they find what they find funny has to do with what their experiences growing up. And so, like if your experience is, um, uh, has has been dark, the way the way that you survive is through humor. Um, you don't really think about that. It just like is part of your who you. So who Queens, you are. So yeah. interrupting the Queens. Connected to your childhood in Poland? Yeah, I was born in Poland. My family stalled back there. My mom is here. Um, she's still in Jersey. And um, when we came over, my mom like, worked in the factories, like off one and nine, and right. you know, Jersey City and um, Elizabeth. And um, we had to leave. Uh, we had to leave our entire family behind. So our growing up was um, really low income, um, super working class, uh, while also, while you know, similarly was difficult back in Poland. Uh, and Queens, um, I lived a little. I lived for a little bit in Queens. I was living in Ridgewood, um, but uh, the play is about um, a group of immigrant women who, at some point in their histories, have were all based in the same basement apartment in Queens, and it travels 17 years of time. Uh, so, uh, some of the same same actresses play their the mothers and their own eventually Americanized daughters over time, um, and it kind of looks at the what. Um, what you have to, or what you eventually end up mm. having to leave behind when you were trying to move your life forward in the lives of other of your of your family. But yeah, the but name, my upbringing. But yeah. the name yeah. Queens yeah. is a geographical locator, but it is also something else. Well, yeah, yeah, it's about women uh, who. Yeah, well, are regal and they're they're um, they have their own domains, they have their own kingdoms. They uh, they're the ones who are upholding. You told the producer their, something else. Women who so, run. Women who, what's that? Women who run blank. Women who, I mean, women who run but I can't say that online. <laughs> I can't say that, right? <laughs> well, listen, we, we, that, we'll, we'll bleep that out. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> that's it, basically it. Yeah. They I mean, get they stuff to. done. Yeah, yeah, they have to. They have to. You got no time. They have, to? they have to. Look, what are you going to do? You, can, you, you, you have to make money. You have to, you have to like, live your life. You have to put food on the table. You have to do these things. Uh, and so, so they're trying to the best of their abilities. I think when you come to the people, when immigrants come to this country, they are given, at least, at least my experience, like that you are given an idea. America sells itself as a certain kind of thing. What's the reality? It's harder than they than they let on, you know. It's I I, I think um, it's not egalitarian. It's not really um, uh, the, it's not equal equal playing field for a lot of people. Um, but it's hard to tell that to other people when um, you're just uh, you're when you're in it when you're in it yourself. Does that um, sound? You think it sounds for some quote unpatriotic to hear you say that? The song was like, hey, I mean, wait a minute, real. you're here. I mean, I think it, you, you have opportunity, the whole yeah, bit. Yeah, but I think it's the responsibility to make sure that that is actually true. I mean, because, 
I know a lot of people for whom that's not true. I feel like I'm an outlier from a lot of the people that I grew up with. You, you are. Know? The fact yeah. that you were, you've had other, you had two other plays that uh, yeah. they were. It was a play called Ironbound. Ironbound, Iron another. Newark. Oh my God! <laughs> For those, you know, search Ironbound <laughs> section of Newark, which yeah. was in a, historically a Portuguese section that's yeah. even more eclectic than ethnically and culturally than ever before. Yeah. Separates Carney Harrison. That's right. And, and Newark. Newark. Oh my God! Yeah. We are getting yeah. so yeah. provincial here. Yeah, yeah. It's and what's the called? The cost of cost of living. Cost of living. Which? How did you know that you were going to write? Um, I didn't. I wasn't really a thing that I was supposed to do, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I mean, my mother was the one who made the journey, and I was like, I guess I'm going along for the ride. I came really <laughs> young. I didn't have much of a choice in the matter. But um, you know, you got to come here and be a doctor and like be a lawyer and take care. Like, there's no. Um, I have to like buy on a house. There's no like, contract that says like because you're an immigrant kid you have to like take care of your parents. But like I should have bought her a house. So when I was going into writing, and that's the thing that I was pulled to, she was like, "Oh please, please don't do this. Don't do this. <laughs> don't do this. Get please a just real me. job. Get a real job. Get a, like I have an office. Please, something." Oh my God. <laughs> so, and you said, "I got to do this." I, well, yeah, I kind of couldn't you help it. I, not really. I mean, I I didn't see theater until I was like uh, 18 years old. Um, but you knew you had stories to tell. Yeah. Well, I had stories, but there was um, it was dangerous to tell them. Um, when I was uh, going to school, I, um, I was the kid who would like bring in 25 pages uh, when the assignment was like two pages because I had I had things to say, things, things to, to say. write about. I had so there was stuff going on at home um, that actually could have, if, if people knew about it, could have mm. incriminated my family, you know. Um, people have no idea, do they? Yeah, yeah. What other people deal with. Uh, yeah, yeah. You mind if we plug again? Yeah, it's just do plug. The play is called Queens? Yeah. Right here in Lincoln Center? Right here in Lincoln Center. Where? At the Claire Tall Theater, I'll see Theater. I just wanted you to say it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Martina. Thank we wish you nothing but the best. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Well Great done. Great to meet you. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to try. All right? Yeah, you're good yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Be right back right <laughs> after this. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Steve Adubato coming to you from the Virtual Reality Center at Rowan University. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Warren Goldman, who is Director, Cooper Neurological Institute, Cooper University Healthcare, and also Professor of Neurological Surgery, Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. So good to have you with us. Thank Doctor, you. this is part of a series of interviews that were really trying to make research come alive, right? You have been involved in medicine for how long? 40 years. Why'd you do it? Why'd you make the decision to go in? Well, I mean, I think I've always wanted to be a physician and the brain is really the great frontier. I won't say it's the last frontier, but it's a great frontier and a tremendous challenge. So in that spirit, um, we're going to be showing some video. Talk to us about what's behind this, right? We see this. This is, in fact, called 3D, right? The 3D body. Explain to us what we're seeing. Yeah, so um, the learning, this is really an educational tool. The traditional way to learn about the body is dissection, which is really not a live process. It's not an interactive process. It's probably the most boring course in medical school to, to dissect a body that's been dead for decades. It has no three-dimensional quality to it. It's not real. The ability to create a three-dimensional interactive uh, visual using the most modern imaging technology is a tremendous uh, teaching tool. It gives tremendous perspective to the live body for interventions such as surgery, mm. and uh, it, it gives us an opportunity to, uh, to develop surgical techniques particularly important for the brain. Devil's advocate, doctor, how is this different from an MRI? An MRI is a two-dimensional depiction. So uh, we use MRI to create these tools. So we take MRI and it's put into the computers of the cave, which is tremendously potent, and it can reconstruct in three dimension, hmm. what we see in two dimension. How would it change, because we're about to see this other wearable technology, but before we go to that, how would this impact a diagnosis, a prognosis, and decisions you would make around patient care? 
about surgery particularly? Well, this is sort of the beginning, and that is this is a teaching tool. So we students can learn about the anatomy uh, in a much more interactive way. This is an immersive technology, and you can actually go through the body layer by layer, organ by organ, and get a much better feeling for how things relate to each other. So this is really a teaching tool. The next step is how we can use this to treat, and that is to use these pictures of the pathological process, such as mm -hmm. someone with a tumor that may be concealed in the lung or in the brain that you otherwise couldn't perceive. So, Doctor, could we do this? Let's move to this whole question of sure. wearable technology, if we could. And again, I, I have to remind myself, this is not my, these are not my cheap sunglasses. These are, this is expensive stuff. This is wearable technology, and we're about to see video, George, if we could. This is video that we're about to see of you wearing this technology, performing surgery. Brain surgery, yes. Break it down for us. Well, for 20 years or so, we have been trying to use uh, images to guide us through surgery and to prepare us for surgery. So the brain is one of those organs that is extremely unique in that you can't manipulate it. What do you mean? You can't move structures aside. If you have a deep-seated tumor in the brain, you can't move things that are in its way, in your way, out of the, so that you can gain access, which you can do for every single other organ in the body. So you have to have a way of looking into the brain and be able to turn things around before you start so that you can develop a surgical corridor in your mind to be able to get to the target or the tumor without damaging anything. You keep calling it a corridor. What do you mean by that? A corridor is a safe access. You can't go through the brain. We tried very much not to go through it because if you go through it, you damage it. So there are ways recognizing where the anatomy is in three dimension and being able to manipulate that so that you can work through crevices, what we call sulci, that is fluid spaces as opposed to the actual tissue. So you really have to have a tremendous knowledge of the anatomy that you can't see. When did you first start using the wearable technology? The wearable technology we started to develop here at Rowan, uh, once we got into the cave, when recognized you couldn't operate in the cave, we wanted Tell to bring- what the cave is, you keep using the term the cave. Well, th this is- this, this is the cave. This is the cave. That's this is the, the cave. The term for it. Right. So you started using this technology a few years ago. Right, about what five did, years ago. What did you see differently? I mean, right off the bat, you've been doing surgery, brain surgery for a while. Yes, this, this gives us the immersive feel that means you could almost go into the brain before you do the operation and plan your surgery. It's, it, it's tremendous uh, uh, to be able to pre-play such a dangerous and vital function before you do it. So, you know, the brain, there's zero tolerance for mistake. So if there's anything goes wrong, that's it. You pay the price. This reduces the odds. This reduces the odds tremendously because you can pre-play it. You can do it in advance and know this is not a safe way to do it. When, when you're talking, I'm curious about this, doctor. When you're talking to patients, right, in broadcasting, we'll often, mistakes happen all the time. We'll say, hey, it's not brain surgery. And I'm realizing we're talking about brain surgery. So we try to, yeah, mistakes can happen in broadcasting. We say it's not life and death. You are dealing with life and death. So when you're talking to patients about what you're about to do and the technology you're about to do it, how much do you tell them? Well, in 2017, disclosure is everything. Yep, we're taking um, this at the end of 2017 to disclose, go ahead. <laughs> so that you, know, you have to balance what the patient needs to know in order to give you an informed consent. So they, you really can't conceal, but you can be compassionate, you can be optimistic. So that's what we have to do. This is a very dangerous thing. This is brain surgery. And we have almost no error, opportunity for error. But we're experienced, we use the latest technology, and we've done this before, and this should go well. Last question. What's the greatest professional and personal reward, satisfaction you get out of your work? Uh, I would say giving a person back their life. 
And this is, counsel, sounds a little melodramatic, but we, we, for an example, we do seizure surgery. And, and people that have been people having have seizures. seizures, epileptic seizures all their life and can't do anything simple as drive a car or have a job. And we do an operation that stops the seizures and they're, they've been given their life back. I mean, that's about as good as it gets. It's about as good as it gets. Doctor, I want to thank you for joining us, breaking this down, and more importantly, for um, helping so many patients uh, with technology, but also with compassion and empathy. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Well done. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by TD Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, PSENG, Adler Aphasia Center, the law firm of Gibbons PC, the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor, and by NJM Insurance Group. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Think this is absurd? Insurance fraud costs every New Jersey family over $1,300 every year. Report fraud at njinsurancefraud.org.